in our midst. I'd like to invite you to stand up if you don't mind. And we're going to be reading one verse of scripture that was read before us today from Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10. Words of comfort to us. Let's read together. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance. I also will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. May the Lord bless his word to every heart. Please be seated. These are words that were said to a church of Philadelphia. The church that is a true church. God is saying to the church, I'm going to spare you the hour of testing. I'm going to spare you what is going to happen to this world when I show up into this world. You will be spared the trial and the testing and the tribulation of this world. God is assuring his true church that they will be spared. Folks, the Lord is coming soon. How many people say he's coming soon? Raise your hand. I think we don't need any more signs for that. We learned last week from what we learned and our text was from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17, if you remember, that the Lord's coming will be coming into two phases. Phase one, he will be coming to rapture his church and take it out of this world. Phase two, he will be coming back with his church to reign on earth. The Lord is coming. He's coming back soon. But the first phase, he's coming to rapture his church. He's coming to take his bride He's coming to take the branch of his vine to take that church away from any tribulation that will be coming. Amen. And we said last week, and I'd like to invite you to review that sermon online. Brother Ed takes quite a bit of effort to do that. So please, you can go back online and see rapture and its exhortation. We said last week, just to remind you, get you back to what we're going to continue with today, that if you reviewed all the rapture texts, and there are many in the Bible, like John 14, verse 3, Revelation 3.10, we just read, 1 Corinthians 15, 51, 52, Philippians 3, 2 to 21, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, 17. If you review those rapture texts, and compare them to the judgment texts like Matthew 13, 34 to 50, Matthew 24, 29, 44, Revelation 19, 11, 21. These are judgment texts. You will see that in none of the rapture texts is there any mention of judgment. So the rapture is not about judgment. The rapture is about deliverance from judgment. The rapture is to take the church before the judgment, the big judgment, the great judgment, the big horrible tribulation will come to this world. There is going to be a tribulation of seven years coming to this world like never before. You'd say, but like what happened in France, I tell you, this is nothing. This is nothing compared to what's going to happen at the tribulation. Tribulation is going to be horrible. There's going to be a series of seven seals of wrath, seven trumpets of fury, and seven bowls of death that is coming to this world in a period that's going to bring wars, pestilence, famine, persecution, death like never before. You don't want to be there. Nobody should plan on remaining there. In that part of Revelation, the book of Revelation that describes the tribulation, chapter 6 through 18. 
the word church is not mentioned never once. Yet, if you go to the beginning of the book of Revelation, chapter 1 to 3, the word church, ecclesia, is mentioned 19 times. What does that tell you? That the church will not be there during the time of tribulation. Right there, after chapter 4, when the Holy Spirit, the Lord tells John, come up. And I want to show you, suddenly the church vanishes from the book of yeah. Revelation. It is not there. And the reason is obvious. Because God never intended for his bride to be judged. The rapture is to spare us the judgment because our judgment was taken by, by Christ. It is time to judge the world who is still unrepentant. Time to judge Israel, national Israel, to bring it to repentance. And we closed last week, before we enter today's message, with an exhortation. We said the greatest exhortation of the rapture is make sure you belong to the true church. Make sure you belong to the church of Philadelphia. Philos, love. Adelphas brotherly the church of brotherly love the church where the love of god has been poured in our hearts by the holy spirit given to us the church of those who are truly born again Amen. only those will be raptured make sure you don't belong to the false church the church of laodicea the lukewarm church the one who's neither hot nor cold about whom the lord said because you're Neither hot nor cold, and you're lukewarm. I'm about to what? Vomit you. Vomit you out of my mouth. That church, the false church, will be vomited into tribulation so that maybe they will repent then. But the true church will be taken up. Make sure you belong to the true church. Make sure you have received that new nature. Make sure you've been born again. And your life is telling the story that you're born again. People say, I'm born again. I say, does your life show it? Make sure you don't belong to the cultish church of Theatira. Theatira. Here's, you know, uh, it's interesting. Theatira, from it, we derive the word theater. It's like a, they put a show. Yeah. It's an act. Fun, games, music, etc. Big church, whatever it is. But it's, a, it's an act. The church of Theatira. Of which... The, to whom the Lord said, I have this against you. Revelation chapter 2, verse 20. Because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Verse 21. I gave her time to repent and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Verse 22. Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her into what? Tribulation. Tribulation. Great tribulation. You see, the cultish church, the false church will go to the tribulation. But the real church will be spared the tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. Unless they repent. God is looking for people to repent. Those who repent... Christ take their judgment. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. There is no condemnation whatsoever. So the greatest exhortation of the rapture is make sure you belong to the real church. To the true church. That was the message of last week in summary. The rapture of the church and its greatest exhortation. Today I'd like to speak to you about the second segment of the rapture, and that is the rapture of the church and its obvious implications. What's implied by the rapture? Let's look back at Revelation chapter 3 verse 10. It says, because you have kept the word of my what? Perseverance. Perseverance. You, my church, who have been given my Holy Spirit. This goes beyond the church of Philadelphia. This goes to any faithful church throughout the ages of the church age. From Pentecost to rapture. 
all the faithful churches, the true church. You have kept the word of my perseverance. You've endured patiently. You've suffered for my name's sake. You stood against the current of this world. You have kept going. Obeying me. Taking my example. Representing me in a world that hates me. In a world that crucified me. Yet you took a stand. And you continued and persevered. Because you have done that. I also will keep you. I'm going to spare you. Don't worry. I know what you've suffered. You've suffered enough. I also will keep you from the hour of testing. From this tribulation that is coming into this world. That hour which is about to come upon the whole world. I'd like you to underline whole world. People think it's going to happen only in the Middle East. They say, okay, I'll, I'll live in America. So that when a tri tribulation is going to come everywhere, folks. This whole planet is going to be struggling and suffering those years of tribulation. But those who belong to Christ will not be there. Which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell in the earth. I love this. Who is going to be tested? Those who dwell on the earth. What does that mean, dwell on the earth? In other words, those who made this world to be their only abode. You know, there are people who say, this is it. That's all I have. I'm going to build the best house. I'm going to get the best car. And I'm going to really amass a fortune. I'm going to have a big company. And you say, but you're going to die. Oh, don't worry. I'll pass it on to my children. And they'll pass it on to their children. I'm going to have a big name. These are the people who dwell on the earth. We are not of those people. Amen. The church of Christ is not of the dwellers of this world. Amen. It says in, uh, in uh, Psalm 17 verse 14, describing those people who dwell in, on, uh, in this world, it says, O oh Lord, from men of the world who have their portion in this life and whose belly, look at this, you fill with your treasure. You know what? They take and they fill their belly, but they don't realize it's coming from God. They are satisfied with children. Oh, I have many children. I have a family. I have inheritance. I'm going to put this in my will and leave their abundance to their babes. Verse 15. But uh, the psalmist says, as for me, as for me who belongs to you, I shall behold your face in righteousness. I will be satisfied with your likeness when I awake. When I'm taken up there, I want to be transformed to be in your likeness. I don't not, I'm not of those who dwell in this world. What a big difference. I think the first implication of the rapture is that it implies that the church is a unique group of people. We are unique, folks. Amen. We're like nobody else. The church is unique. Yes, yes. It's distinct. It is different from everybody, from the whole world, and even from Israel. Yes. That's right. Even from Israel. You see, people say, well, we'd like to equate Israel and the church are the same. No, no, no. no. The church is one entity, and Israel is another entity, and the world is another entity. Israel, God still has purposes for Israel, for national Israel. He's still going to work on Israel. And one day, through the tribulation, he will bring many Jews to him. Yes. He's still working on them. He will continue working with them until he brings a revival among them. But the true church... The church of the born again, spiritually, will be taken out of the scene. It doesn't need to be judged. It doesn't need to be refined. It has been refined already through repentance and acceptance of Christ as Lord and Savior. So, I strongly believe, and I think if you review last week's message and compare to this, today's message, that if you put all those things together you will realize that the rapture texts never speak about any judgment. You remember our text of last week? 
Let's read it very quickly. Second, First Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16. It says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will first rise. Then we who are alive, verse 17, and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so we shall always be with the Lord. Verse 18, it says, Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Words of comfort. The rapture is about comfort. The rapture is for this unique group of people called the church, the true church of Jesus Christ. Amen. And only to them are those words of comfort are addressed. The rapture scares the rest of the people. When we tell people the Lord is coming, they say, I hope not. Not now. When I speak to people around the hospital, I say, Jesus is coming back. They say, well, hopefully not right away because um, we don't want him. He's going to be intruding on us. They're not ready for him. They don't want him around. But we say, even so, come, Lord Jesus. We want to go. They are afraid because they know that tribulation is coming upon them. Ask anybody. They say, oh, it's going to be bad. It's going to get worse. This tribulation period fulfills the period of one week of seven years among the 70 weeks of years that was promised to God's people by the prophet Daniel. Daniel chapter 9, we don't have to look at it right now, verse 24 to 27, you can look at it at home, was given a prophecy, and the prophecy said, it's been appointed to your people, Daniel, your people, that's Israel, Jacob, a period of 70 weeks. And it will start at the edict of rebuilding Jerusalem. And out of those 70 weeks, 69 weeks have passed. There's remaining only one week. The seven years that is pertaining to the same nation. The nation of Israel, Daniel's people, Jacob. As a matter of fact, we're talking about this verse of scripture in Jeremiah, chapter 30, verse 7. It is addressed to Israel. It is to warn Israel. It is to awaken Israel. Jeremiah, chapter 30, verse 7 says, Alas, for that day, that day, the day of the Lord, the tribulation, is great. There is none like it, and it is time of Jacob's distress, but he will be saved from it. I think it implies he will be saved through it. This will be a time when the Antichrist will make a false treaty with Israel. And during that time, he will go and erect this abomination of desolation, this statue in the temple. We read about it last week when we looked at, at Matthew 24, when he says, when you see the abomination of desolation in the holy place, we read that at that time, implying that that is said in the book of Daniel, God was saying, Jesus Christ was saying, when you see what Daniel was given as a prophecy, that there will be an abomination of desolation in that holy place in the temple, let those who are in Judea run away. Judea, because when the Antichrist is going to erect that statue over there, and the Jews are going to say, what happened? We are not supposed to have statues and idols in the temple. And he would say, whoever doesn't bow down and adore the statue will be killed. So the people in Judea will be caught first and they will have to run away. And then he said, those who are on the roof, don't come down. Those who don't have their clothes, don't come back with your clothes. Run away and pray that this will not happen in the winter. It will not happen on a Sabbath. On a Sabbath. Why on a Sabbath? Because the Jews are told in Exodus not to walk long distances on the Sabbath so you cannot run far enough to escape. This was given to Israel. This is the day of trouble of Jacob. Jacob's trouble. The time of Jacob's trouble but he shall be saved from it. He shall be saved through it. During that tribulation many Jewish people will be saved. It says in Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10 and I will pour 
on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication so that they look on me whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn they will suddenly realize that Jesus Christ is the Messiah they've always been waiting for Amen. and they will come to repentance and God will populate the world with believers during the tribulation made of Gentiles who've repented and Jewish people who've repented and accepted Jesus Christ. The tribulation time is a time of judgment, refinement, a fire that will bring repentance into the hearts of many. But the church will not be here. The church has been refined already. The church has been convicted of their sins. They've been, they've been cleansed, forgiven, inhabited by the Holy Spirit. The true church will not be here during the tribulation. You say to me, but uh, Israel is the same, isn't it? I say to you, no. No, Israel is a different entity. You see, the true church is made of those who are born again spiritually. National Israel is about being physically born as a Jew. You say, what about spiritual Israel? What about, tell me about Moses, about Abraham, about the prophets. What about them? And I'll tell you that spiritual Israel was there once upon a time before Pentecost. That's right. Before Pentecost, prior to Pentecost, they were saved individual and there was no church, but there was spiritual Israel. After Pentecost and until the rapture, there is no more spiritual Israel. There is a church. After the rapture, we will find no church, but there will be a true spiritual Israel again. The rapture concerns the church, the true church, and only the church, because the church is very unique. It is very precious in the eyes of God. The rapture will remove not all who say, I'm Christian, but those who truly were born again Christians. And it will leave behind all those who made a, just a profession that are not real, and those who are not believers, and of course, national Israel will remain and during the tribulation many will be saved you say to me well what's wrong with that how about just hanging around and go through the tribulation and get saved then I want to tell you why it's not a good idea because during that tribulation time people will be under the full authority of Satan that's right can you believe it that Revelation 13 verse 7 says that God will allow Satan to master and have authority over everybody in the world. It says, it also was given to him, to the beast, to Satan, who is empowering the beast, to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. You don't want to be in the tribulation because Satan is going to have authority over everybody. And the price of coming to Christ during tribulation will be martyrdom. People will be martyred. You think that ISIS is martyring some people? They'll be martyred by, by the millions. Because anytime somebody declares their faith in Jesus Christ... Satan will recognize him, and as soon as he recognizes, he will be martyred. You don't want to be in the tribulation. You're much better off escaping the tribulation because, you know, and I get that from people who say, well, what's wrong with that? I'll find out that I'm not a Christian, then I'll accept Jesus during the tribulation. I say, well, yes, but, you know, it's not going to be as easy as you think. Why don't you take the easy route and get saved now before the tribulation and not wait until then? Remember what we spoke about from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, 17 last time? We said that the young church of Thessalonica was concerned that the rapture will happen to them and those who died will miss out on the glory of the rapture. So the Apostle Paul wanted to calm their anxiety. And he said, don't worry. 
Those who died before the rapture happens, if the rapture was to happen today, will be awakened first, and then we will join with them, and everybody will be together. Every person who belongs to Jesus Christ will be at the rapture. Whether he's dead before the rapture, his body then is glorified, and his soul, which is with the Lord, will join together, and then we who are alive will be changed and will be caught up, caught up, harpazo, raptus, from which we, come, we get the word rapture. Raptus in Latin, harpazo in Greek, will be caught up. In English, they didn't translate the rapture, they said caught up. We will be taken suddenly, and we'll be there with the Lord. So comfort yourselves with these words. Nobody who belongs to Jesus Christ will miss on the rapture because everybody who belongs to Jesus Christ is part of this unique structure called the church. Christ's body, his bride, the object of his love, the branch of his vine. The church is the dearest group of people to God's heart. Remember Acts chapter 20 says, the church that he purchased with his own blood. You know, sometimes we say, I paid blood for it. Well, Jesus Christ didn't just say it in words. He actually paid his blood for the church. So you are extremely precious and you will not be going through the tribulation because you are the body of Christ. Satan cannot have a sway upon you. If the church was to stay here during the tribulation, the church should be under the authority of Satan. Therefore, Christ will not be the head of the church anymore. That's unthinkable. Cannot happen. It will not happen. And the Thessalonians knew that, but they were concerned that those who died will miss out on the glory of the rapture. And Apostle Paul told them, they're not going to miss out. Don't worry about them. Keep living your life and don't worry about it because everybody is going to be taken out from the scene and everybody will be together at the rapture. If we turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 1, you see the apostle how he tunes his message to the Thessalonians to assure them not to worry about the tribulation. He says, now as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need for anything to be written to you. In other words, I don't need to tell you about the horrors of the tribulation. Verse 2. For you yourself know full well that the day of the Lord, this is it, the day of tribulation, day of the Lord, the day of wrath, will come just like a thief in the night. But that's not for you. I don't want you to worry about it. Amen. Then he goes, verse 3. While not is the pronoun. Would you underline the pronoun in your, in your, in your mind? While they... While they are saying, who's they? They, the people who dwell on the earth. They, the unbelievers. While they are saying peace and safety, then the destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child. And they will not escape. Now notice how the pronoun will change suddenly. Verse 4. But you, you see, there's a difference between they and what? You. And you, you are unique. They are different. They will suffer. It will come upon them. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief. You're not part of them. You're different. This day is not for you. It's not going to catch you unprepared. You're going to be taken out of the scene. Amen. Says verse 5. For you are all, what? Sons of light. Sons of the day. We are not of night nor of darkness. We have been transported from darkness into light. We have been taken out for God who has commanded that light comes to this world has shone into our hearts by giving us the image, the spirit of and to see the glory of God in the image of Jesus Christ. We have been awakened. We belong to Christ. So he's telling the Thessalonians, don't worry about it. They are going to suffer. They will not escape. But you, you're not like them. You're different. You are people of light, not of darkness. So the first implication of the rapture is that the church is a very unique group of people. It is the body of Christ. It is the bride of Christ. And will not, cannot, 
suffer any tribulation will be taken out of the scene before the tribulation. What's the second implication? Second implication of the rapture, because you're such a unique group of people, you are expected to live in a unique fashion. You see, people want always the privilege, but they don't like the responsibility. Well, you know, every privilege of God comes with the responsibility as well. Because you are so unique, I want you to live in a manner that's very unique. So he goes on. Therefore, verse 6. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us be what? Alert and sober. I like that word sober. I don't want you to be drunk. I don't want you to be intoxicated by this world or by the intoxicants of this world. I don't want you to be having a merry party all the time like this world. I want to be serious. I want you to, ex to exert self-control. We don't do just what comes. We ask the Lord, what can we do? You're invited to places you need to ask, is this a place that glorifies the Lord or not? We're not part of this world. Oh, they're doing it in the world. Who cares whether they do it or not? How about you? You are unique. That represents your God as a unique group of people. And he says, verse 7, For those who sleep, do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. You see, there are people, even in the church, unfortunately, sometimes they say, I don't care. Don't be of those who don't care. Don't sleep. Don't be indifferent. Be concerned. Be always observing the events around you and the opportunities given to you. We as Christians should be always trying to snatch from the hand of Satan people who are going to hell. That's right. And I want to tell you, every Christian who's not productive in bringing people to Christ, there's something wrong with that Christian. He's asleep. We are not supposed to be asleep. And I'm saying it to this group of people right here. I want to tell you, why isn't this church doubling within six months? I want to tell you why. Because everybody in this church is not taking his or her job seriously. We should be productive people. We should be inviting people. We should be talking to people. We should be evangelizing people. We should be doing an effort. We cannot go to sleep and say, let the world go to hell. They sleep, but we don't sleep. And then, those who get drunk, get drunk at night. When they are dabbling with sin, we don't do that. We don't do that. We are people of light. We are not of darkness. And it says in verse 8, but since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the what? The breastplate of faith. You know, that very big shield of faith that protects you from the outside, from the arrows of the enemy. It cannot penetrate because my God is in control. My God is sovereign. And also, there's another, another shield inside of love. See, the inside is soft and gentle, but the outside is strong, can sustain the temptations and the arrows of the enemy. And then as a helmet, the hope of salvation. As a helmet, I know I got saved from sin. He's not talking about salvation, justification. He's not talking about salvation from the power of sin, but salvation from this body, from this world. From, he's talking about glorification. I'm heading to heaven. What made the martyrs throughout the church history stand? The threats and the torture and the killing. It's this. It doesn't matter whether they kill me, I'm going to heaven. It doesn't matter whether they burn me, I'm going to heaven. They stood there and they brought the entire Roman Empire to finally cease to persecute the church because they said these people are not afraid of death. These people are praying for their executioners. These people are loving those who are tormenting them. The world was puzzled, and I think it should be puzzled by us. We need to be an, such a unique group of people that is behaving in such a unique manner that the world will point to us and say, they are different. And God says, because you're so unique, I want you to live in a unique manner. That's what the implication of the rapture is. We're heading to heaven. 
will then behave like you are heading to heaven. You know that you're going to be taken up and glorified, then act like someone who's going to be glorified. It says, for God, verse 9, for God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. There you have it again and again and again. You're spared. You're going to be protected. I'm going to take care of you. Nobody will touch you. Nobody will ever come to you. But because of that, I expect you to start behaving differently. I don't want you to have their fears, have their worries, have their concerns, have their plans. You need to be different. Act different. Be sober. Be watchful. Be awakened. Be serious. Be in self-control. Don't get intoxicated by this world. This world is not yours. You're passing by. I will protect you and I will take care of you. I was reading today this verse of scripture from Isaiah 41 and verse 10 for people of the Lord. Says, he says to them, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I will do everything for you. You don't need to worry about it. You don't need to be concerned. And I want to tell you, because of that, the rapture is not going to take us by surprise. But what if it takes us by surprise? What if some of us would say, you know what? I don't think the Lord is coming back soon. I was saying that in the conference yesterday. I remember this young lady. I was once talking to her about the Lord. She said, I hope he doesn't come back soon because I, I'm going to get married in three months. I said, what if he comes back sooner? And you go to marry Jesus in heaven. She said, well, I have my plans. Hopefully none of us has his or her plans that are ahead of God's plans. God's plans are much better. But what if one of us says, I don't think he's coming back soon? The Lord Jesus gave a parable about that servant. He says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 48, but if that, and I'm not saying it, Jesus is saying it. If that what? Evil slave. Evil slave. That's right. Evil slave says in his heart, my master is not coming for a long time. You say to me, Brother Ray, are you telling me that it's evil to say that the Lord is not coming back soon? I say yes. And I'm not just saying it, the Lord is saying it. Because the moment you say the Lord is not coming back for quite a while, you're removing the greatest incentive to live a serious Christian life. Amen. If I know that he's not coming back for a long time, I can really mess up for a while, then I'll make up for it. You take out the greatest incentive to purify your life. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And verse 3, right after it, it says, And everyone who has this hope fixed on him, what? Purifies, Purifies himself just as he's pure. When you realize that the rapture can happen any moment, and it can happen any moment, there's no signs that are needed for a rapture, you begin fixing your life today because you don't want to be caught off guard. You start living expectantly with this idea of the imminence of the rapture coming any time. I brought a little uh, something with me. Do you mind putting it? Video. I'd like to show you that one minute video. I found it on YouTube and I, I thought it's, it's very expressive. Just, just look at this. Jesus Christ is coming back for his church. Put it louder. That's okay. This is the scene of the rapture. 
Jesus Christ can come back next month. He can come back next week. He could come back right now. And I mean, you may see this thing drop. And I hope you don't see it. I hope you'll be part of the people who go up. Because he's coming as light flashes, as the sun rises at the twinkle of an eye in a moment in this short sudden time Jesus will be coming to rapture his church are you ready are we ready do you want to make yourself ready do you realize that this can happen any moment we don't have time to plan and to say I think the time to to begin preparing is right now Lord Jesus when they said in Luke 18 8 when the Son of Man comes will he find faith on the earth will he find you faithful will he find me faithful will he find you living the life that he has designed you to live will he find you using the gifts that he has given you will he find you being serious with what he has appointed you on will he find you really faithful in carrying on the message and carrying on the evangelism that he has given you would he find you faithful would he find me faithful I think we need to start searching ourselves asking the Holy Spirit to search each one of us and say Lord search me Amen. look beneath this veneer that I put on before people and tell me where I am short what I need to fix because I don't want to be ashamed that you're coming I want to be of those who truly belong I think the message of the rapture speaks to both unbelievers and believers to unbelievers it says get ready because he's coming and the rapture you don't want to miss it because then you'll enter tribulation make sure you're part of the true church of Jesus Christ that you have repented of your sins that you have accepted Jesus and Jesus alone as your Lord and Savior and that you have begun living a different lifestyle ever since we all brag about days of our birthdays do you have a day of your second birthday is it imprinted in your brain is it imprinted in your life is it imprinted in your society people should point at you and say something happened to him or her has it happened to you if it hasn't the time to get ready is right now to throw yourself like the publican at his mercy and say have mercy on me Lord a sinner and that person went to his house justified he will be justified the moment you repent of your sins it's only for repentant sinners that justification comes and after you've done that begin living every day in the presence of Christ may God help us to do so let's bow our heads in prayer the rapture is coming Christ is coming he's coming first to take his church his true church and then when we do that we're going to be standing before the judgment seat of Christ we believers who have been taken up to receive rewards for everything we've done in the flesh serving him was it done for his glory is my life glorifying him do I know him for real do I belong to him am I part of this unique group called the true church of Christ of whom it was said I would spare you from the hour of trial that is coming on those who dwell on the earth or do I have a foot in the world and a foot with God do I have a foot on the land of truth and another foot in the ocean of the world I want to tell you there's nothing worse in the eyes of God than someone who's double-minded a double-minded man is despised by God I think it's time to come and say Lord unify my heart in you and you alone remove from me all that love of the world love of pride of life lust of the eyes lust of the flesh all that's in this world that is perishing remove it from me Lord I repent from it I want to belong to you entirely body mind and spirit because I know that very soon I'm gonna hear that shout I'm gonna hear the voice of an archangel the trumpet of God and I'm gonna be changed 
and I'm going to be raptured from this world. Lord, help me not to be ashamed on that day. Help me not to be ashamed. I pray that the Holy Spirit will visit us in this place, each and every one, to each one, honestly, analyze yourself in the presence of God and ask yourself, are there matters in your life you need to fix? Well, you may not have time to fix them. I think the time is right now. Determine. Make a decision. And make a determination. Today is the day when I'm going to truly fix everything that is shady in my life. Relationships that are shady, I'm going to put them away. Activities that are shady, I'm going to put away. That's it. From here on, I'm going to begin asking the Lord's opinion on everything I do, I say, or I plan. I'm going to live for Him. So when He comes, He will find me faithful. And He'll receive me by saying, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the rest of your master. I want to be of those. I want to be of those. How many people, by raising your hand, you want to be of those who will be found good and faithful. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. You want to be found good and faithful? Happy are you. Blessed are you. And you are not sure. You don't know how to be good and faithful. Then ask for his help today and tell him, Lord, help me to be good and faithful. Change me, Lord. Give me a new perspective. Open my eyes. Because I would like to start all over with you. May God help us to do that in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. God bless you and keep you and help us all to meet him with smiley faces and see his face smiling at each one of us when he comes back. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah.